Who can measure the value of health? You know, some of the richest people on the planet would give away all their wealth just to be healthy. Because the healthier we are, the more our world expands. But there's so much more to health than just the physical aspect. There's mental, emotional, spiritual, relational, and financial health, just to name a few. Fact is, every one of us can be healthier. And this message series is about taking those practical steps toward living life at our very best. Hey, good morning. When I started this series, I never dreamed I would be preaching this message. My first plan was to bring you a message on being financially healthy. And you guys know we're in a series about being healthy. And we said that the healthier you are, the world that you live in gets bigger. And the less healthy we are, the more our world shrinks. Well, we've got a great ministry coming up, Financial Peace, Dave Ramsey's ministry. And so if you're struggling in that area or if you just want to be healthier financially, I want to challenge you to get everything you can get as far as information to think about being part of that. But the message I have to bring to you today is something that just God put on my heart and he won't let me free from. In fact, Mary Alice was in the services last night. She could tell you that I agonized in prayer over this message. In week one, I shared with you how that truth is uphill. And by that, I mean... Truth is always challenging. You can fall backside backwards into a lie, but truth is always going to require going uphill. And God just put this message on my heart, and I bring it to you today. And if you feel like at the end of this message that you don't like it, then I want to just kind of let you know why I'm, why I'm preaching this message. As leader of our church, I'm responsible I'm responsible for the message. I'm not responsible for how we live our lives. This is a grace ministry, and grace is not about control. Some of us have been in religious systems that were control systems. Well, I, I, we're not that way here at New Spring. I, I never forget that whenever we walk out these doors, we're free to make whatever choices we want to make. But I am responsible for the message. There's a verse in the book of Ezekiel, actually a set of verses, in which God tells his prophet if you deliver the truth, then you have delivered your own soul. He said, it's up to the people at that point. But he said, if you fail to tell them the truth, God said, I will require their blood at your hands. And because of that, I realized someday I'm going to give an account to God for how I led New Spring Church and the message that I preached. We live in a day, and, and I don't know, maybe I'm part of this, but I think we have the weakest group of preachers in the history of the world since the days of ancient Israel. These are days, we're in the last days. We talked about that in Clash of Dynasties. We understand that this world is headed for the tribulation. It's headed for the Antichrist coming and Jesus is coming. And it's a day where preachers, I believe, need to stand up and speak up for the truth. And yet, it seems to me that a lot of us, and maybe I'm in this category, I hope not, but in a day when we should be standing up and declaring God's truth, we are arranging, rearranging our sock drawers, saying things that every Christian should know, and they're safe, and they don't cause any unrest or upset. But at the end of the day, it's not really getting us where we need to go. And so for that reason today, I bring you a message that God has put on my heart. And one more time, please understand, I'm not trying to control anyone. That's so, I'm, I'm, it's everything I can do to keep Mark straight. But I do know that when Jesus came into our world, the Bible says about him that he was full of grace and truth. And there's no such thing as having a relationship with God that's only a grace relationship. And I, I quickly qualify that by saying this. We live in a world today where Christians a lot of times say, well, God is a God of love. And suddenly there's the idea that that excuses anything. But you can't have that kind of God. I mean, that isn't the true God. It, it's a caricature of God. Because while God is infinitely a God of grace, he is also infinitely a God of truth. Remember, Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. There is no grace without truth, and there is no truth without grace. We live in a culture today where preachers like myself, and, and maybe, I'm, maybe this is a mea culpa, where preachers are quick to talk about the grace of God as well we should, and we should never stop talking about the grace of God. But we're a little light on the truth side. And so because of that today, I wanna bring a message, because here's the deal. If we're going to be healthy in any area, be it physical, spiritual, financial, emotional, sexual, if we're going to be healthy in any area, we have to make healthy choices. At the end of the day, it won't be your ideas that tell your story. It won't be your opinions that tell your story. It will be your choices. 
What did you do when you came to the moment of decision? I'm working through something really difficult right now. There was a great Christian leader, at least he appeared to be great, pastor of one of the largest churches in America, definitely one of the most influential pastors of the late 20th century. And he wrote a number of books that really inspired me in the early days of my pastorate well over 30 years ago. But one book he wrote changed my life. It was a book about integrity, but not just the kind of integrity that passes public scrutiny, but a book about private scrutiny. It, 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 challenged, it challenged every reader to look into his heart or her heart and see if there was total integrity, total honesty before God and before ourselves. And, and that book was transformative for me. And it's been interesting through the decades as I've traveled and spoken around the country, how many other Christian leaders have said to me, that book changed my life. Now, I don't think there are but a handful of New Springers who were here 30 plus years ago when I preached a series called Honest or Let's Get Real. And it was because I had read that book that I was challenged to bring that series. And yet last year, and I'll be careful or else some of you will be able to connect the dots, but last year this minister had a colossal crash and burn, and it wasn't just something that happened recently there was a problem that goes back over the last 30 plus years. Now this guy was, as I say, one of the most influential pastors in America. When President Clinton had his moral failure, he asked this pastor to come in and minister to him during that time. And I'm trying to work through this because I'm trying to figure out, was he always a fraud? I mean, because the book that he wrote had truth in it, but clearly what happened was Whatever he believed, when he came to the moment of deciding about what he was going to do in his life, he made bad choices. We hear today about that. In fact, we have for the last couple of decades. When someone that we know or love is not doing well and we find ourselves talking about him or at being asked about him from someone else, we try to be euphemistic. We, try, we, we don't want to talk about, I hope we don't talk about the specifics of when people are doing bad things. I, I hope we have more sympathy and concern for prayer and for sadness other than gossip. But you know how we are and someone says, well, what about him right now? We say, well, he's in a bad place. Well, what do you mean he's in a bad place? And we handle it euphemistically but correctly by saying he's making bad choices right now. Or she's in a bad place because she's making bad choices right now. And that's very accurate. Because anytime we're in a bad place, and I don't mean in a bad place because of something someone else is doing, but when it's relational to our own choices, it's really true that we're in a bad place because we make bad choices. Heaven pity the person who can't connect the dots, who's in a bad place because of bad choices and doesn't see those dots connected. But here's what I want to talk about today. And this is so important, and I just don't think we preachers are talking enough about this. Before we analyze the choices that we're making, we need to understand that there's something more fundamental. You know, we all like to think, hey, I make up my own mind, but I don't really know how true that is with any of us. Our choices are typically a product of the voices in our lives. What are the voices that we listen to? This is one of the most important questions that I will ever ask you as your pastor, but when it comes to making the choices about what you believe and what your positions are and how you live your life, who really are the voices that speak into your life? Because see, here's the thing. If we say we are Christ followers, that is the, busy, busy, it's the biggest designation in our lives. It's way bigger than where we grew up. It's way bigger than where we went to college. It's, it's infinitely bigger than what we do for a living Following Jesus is the biggest thing in our lives, if indeed it is truly following Jesus. The most important thing in my life is when I die, I'm going to heaven because Jesus Christ, God's son, came, hung on a cross for me, and his blood paid for my sins, and because of that, I'm going to live forever. Nothing in my life, not anything, not my race, not my gender, not my, not my situation, not where I work, nothing is as big as that. So if, if that is the biggest thing in our lives, the question that we need to ask is, what are the voices that speak into our choices? I bring this message today because when Christians are analyzed individually by interview and definitely scientifically by polls, Christians today are claiming to believe things that are 180 degrees away from God's word. It's so peculiar because people who claim to follow Jesus, people who claim to believe the word of God, have ideas about life 
that are so contrary to God, and it's getting worse and worse. I'm going to give you an example. I read an article this week about how Christians are distancing themselves from Israel, and there's the idea that, well, you know, 30 years ago, Christians supported Israel much more than today, and that number's dropping, and because Christians are saying they just don't have support for Israel. <laughs> have you read Romans 9? Have we read Romans 10? Have you read Romans 11? Have you read, have you read the Old Testament? Have you read the book of Revelation? Have you read the book of Daniel? I mean, here's the thing. That's something that God tells us. And so today we have a, a situation where Christians are believing all kinds of things, totally antithetical to the word of God, and yet claiming at the same time to follow Jesus. And as I said, this is going to be one of the most important questions that I ever ask, whether you're in South Auditorium, North Auditorium, watching online, watching on television, who speaks into your choices? What are the voices that frame your choices? The average Christian today, and I don't mean the average New Springer, but the average Christian today gets most of the voices from the culture, the popular culture. Did you know in the Bible that there's a frequent word for the prevailing culture? The Bible calls it the world. And by the world, Scripture isn't talking about the planet or the people who live on the planet, but it talks about the world as in a system. I mean, I think a person would really be blind not to recognize that there is a prevailing system in our culture that's, that crosses over from voice to voice, from entertainment to media to religion to technology. There's a consistent voice of the culture, and the Bible calls that the world. And, and here's the thing. Scripture tells us, do not love the world in 1 John 2.15. And, and by the world, let me just supple, let me supplement the word system there, because I think it fits a lot better. Do not, love any, do not love the system or anything in the system. If anyone loves the system, the, look at this. The love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the system, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And this is what stands out to me, verse 17. The system and its desires are in the process of passing away. But the person who does the will of God will last forever. So yeah, there are the voices of the prevailing system. And, and here is the thing. I, I get it. I know that we're pressured and bullied every day into buying into the system. And there is this feeling that if you go against the grain, that something is wrong with you. But you know, here's the thing. And, and Stephen, my son, told me a story last night before the 4 o'clock service that really helped me process this. There was a prehistoric reality show that was way before all our time. So just go ahead and realize we probably haven't seen this show. It was called Candid Camera. Now, Candid Camera was a show that set people up in tricky situations with the cameras. And then, of course, people walked into those tricky situations and did dumb things, and it became entertainment for the rest of the country. But one of the most famous Candid Camera episodes was from 1962 called Face the Rear. And sociologists and scientists still study it to this day. What, what they did was a person would get on the elevator on the ground floor, and it would be worked out where the elevator would have to make a couple of stops. Now, at the first stop, here's the person you know, got on the elevator, he's looking at the doors, looking at the outside like we all do. Three actors got on, and they walked immediately to the back of the elevator and faced the rear. And the cameras came in on the person who had gotten on the elevator, and he's looking over his shoulder and wondering, what's going on, and why are they facing the rear, and should I be facing the rear? But at the next stop, another actor got on, a fourth actor, and he immediately joined the others in the back and faced the rear. In every situation, the first person who got on the elevator turned around and faced the rear. When I think about American Christianity, that's what I see today. We're leaning forward, we're facing forward because we know it's right and we know it's truth. But enough people get on the elevator and face the rear, and you know what we do? I don't mean us personally, but so many of us face the rear. We don't know why we're facing the rear, it's just everybody else is. See, here's the thing. If choices start with voices, then healthy choices require something essential. Healthy choices require truth. Truth. The truth. Jesus called it like this. In John 8, 31, he said, you're truly my disciples. Think, listen to that. You're truly my disciples. Not if you say you are. If you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
Well, in the audience that day, there were those who rejected Jesus' teaching. So 12 verses later, he had another statement to make, and we really need to own this today. He said to these people, you're, of your, you're the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. And look at this. He, has, he Satan, has always hated the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All the lights should go on here. So when I tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. See, if everybody's facing the rear of the elevator, it makes sense not to face the front. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you're listening to the lies of the culture and buying into them, Jesus said, you naturally won't believe him. And that's cosmically threatening to me today. I hope it is to all of us. So like we talked about the person that turned around in the elevator, how does Satan get us to believe a lie? Well, I I know that all of us are too smart for him to just come along and tell us a lie and for us to believe it. I think it's really important right now for us to understand that Satan has three tricks to get you to believe a lie. And they're, they're stages of his work. And we see them all in Genesis chapter 3, which is the first time with our first parents that he got them to believe a lie. And I want you to see these really clearly. The first one is truth is negotiable. We live in a world today and where there are those who say there are no absolutes. Of course, the statement there are no absolutes is an absolute statement, but consistency never seems to be a problem with our culture. But the first idea is to get us to believe that truth is negotiable. We see this when Satan said to Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? It's just a question. It's just a question of the truth. And then the second stage, and if he can ever get us to go here, really he's got us to the third stage. It's a slippery slope between number two and three. But the second stage is truth is individual. Satan said to Eve, God knows that when you eat of it, Your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing or deciding good and evil. In other words, Eve, listen, now that I've got you to believe that truth is negotiable, let me tell you something else. You can actually have your own truth, and you can decide what is true and what is not true. One of the things that I'm so amazed at, and I've heard this so many times, I've had people tell me, well, I just get a little bit from every religion. I get the good from all religions, and it's like, you do realize you made it all up. You know, has that ever crossed your mind? You know, you've made it all up. And then the third stage, and as I said, if he can get you to number two, number three is just a quick trip. And that is to believe that truth is a lie and a lie is the truth. Satan said to Eve, you will not surely die. You remember, at first he got her just a question. Truth is negotiable. And then he said, hey, you can have your own truth. Ergo, it's kind of like the transitive principle. Ergo, truth is a lie and a lie is the truth. You will not surely die. Now for us today, it is the middle one that I'm concerned about because we live in a culture today that is, well, it's put into our nomenclature, our jargon, the idea that I have my truth and you have your truth. We we hear people today that say, well, this is my truth. (sighs) Do we ever think anymore? Does anyone ever think critically in America? You do realize that when you go down to the courthouse in Sedgwick County or any other courthouse, that the bailiff asks you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I don't think bailiffs are asking anyone, do you swear to tell your truth? Defendants do that. What is wrong with our culture today? There's a sort of cultural insanity, this inability to think critically. But do we understand that if we, can, if we can get to the place where we believe we have our truth, what it does is it makes us the rock and it makes God the clay. And God tells us in his word, God says, I am the potter, you are the clay. And the idea that one can be a follower of God or a Christian and say, I have my truth, therefore God must adjust to me is cosmically suicidal. And Christians today... Well, it's being preached from our culture and people who claim to follow Jesus are parroting this deadly poison. But friends, I would plead with you today to throw this idea down like the deadly snake that it is. In 1 John 2 verse 3, the Bible says, we know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. 
Now, and real quickly, I want everybody to take a deep breath here. There's nothing wrong with having your opinion. There's nothing wrong with saying, this is the way I see it. Of course, that's human. And, but think about those two statements. Those statements leave room for correction, don't they? If, if I say, this is how I see things to my wife, and she sees things differently and speaks truth into me, I hopefully will adjust to that. There's nothing in the world wrong with saying, hey, I have an opinion about this, or I, I, this is how I see things. But we cross, we cross a chasm. We cross, a, 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 I can't even, can't even say how infinitely important that chasm is. We cross an infinitely important chasm when we go from this is my opinion to this is my truth. Because the moment I say my truth, I have said, and there should be no one mistaking this, I have said, I am God. See, somebody has already said that he was the truth. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to his disciples on the night of his arrest, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what does it all add up to? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the most important voice that you can make, listen to for making your choice is the Word of God, God's Word. And I know it's archaic. I know that we're evolved today. We're woke. <laughs> Which, that's a good thing. You know, the Bible tells us it's, it's high time now to awake out of sleep. So, hey, being woke, that's kind of what I'm talking about today. But a lot of times when that, that's made, it's the idea that this culture seems to know more than any culture before it. We're evolved. I'm not really sure we're the sharpest knives in the drawer. But I do remember something that Jesus said, and we would all do well who are followers of Jesus to take it into consideration. Jesus told a story one day about a couple of builders. And he said there was a guy who built his house on the rock, and there was the guy next door to him who built a house on the sand. And the storm came to both, just like the storms of life will come to both non-theists and Christians alike. But the house that was on the rock stood when the storm came, and the house on the sand collapsed. Now, that story is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I love all the Gospels for different reasons because they, just, they speak in, in different ways to the same story. But I love Dr. Luke, and, and, and I'm not going to say I have a favorite Gospel, but I do love to read Dr. Luke. And Dr. Luke puts an expression in there that the others didn't include. And I want to just read his version to you, okay? This is in Luke 6, 40, 47, Jesus speaking. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who, look at the next two words, dug deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. Now stay with me if you grew up in church like I did. When you listen to Dr. Luke's account of the story, you know, I, forgive me for breaking the sentence and getting out of order here, but I grew up thinking, okay, there was a guy who built on rock, and in my imagination, he just found a big pl rock plateau and set his house right on top of the rock. And then I saw a guy who built his house on the sand. Dr. Luke is saying it's not exactly how it was. The surface beneath both houses was sand, the, the first surface. But the guy who built on the rock dug deep, and he didn't stop until he cut through the sand and he laid his house on rock. In fact, this is interesting. This doesn't really add to the sermon. But in 2013, there was an article about building on sandy soil. There were seven tips, and tip number three was go deep. Hey, Jesus had it right. <laughs> now, here's the question. In a way, all of us have that first soil underneath us of sand. We live in this culture. We, we watch entertainment. We, we're on social media. There is that, that culture of sand below all of us. The question is, do we cut through the sand? Are you capable of cutting through the sand and not stopping until you find truth? Because who wants to build on sand? It shifts, doesn't it? One day something's right, the next day something's wrong. One day something's wrong, the next day it's right. That's sand for you. Satan's at work like never before. And frankly, he's got most of the microphones. He has the microphone of entertainment. He's got the microphone of some of higher education a lot of religion, and a ton of what we call political correctness. <laughs> Have you ever thought about political correctness as a term? It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? If you're correct, you don't have to worry about being political. And if you're political, just leave it there. <laughs> you're either correct or you're not correct. 
Do you know what the problem is with political correctness? Because the fact of the matter is, some of political correctness is correct. But here's the problem with political correctness, and, and if, if, if just be open to this and let Scripture speak into it, and then you consider how you re- react to this. God talks about the people in our generation, and he says that they re- disregarded or literally ignored the righteousness from God and attempted to establish their own righteousness, and they've not submitted to the righteousness of God. In other words, they don't like God's plan of being of right and wrong, so they said, we will develop our own system of right and wrong. And that is what we have. Think about political correctness. Just back away from it. Whatever your perspective, you may hate it, you may love it, but whatever we are, back away from it for a moment and just consider it intellectually. When you watch, when you watch it manifest itself in our nation, you sort of get the idea that the mob says the rules are what we feel like they are. But then the people in our country are in whiplash. They don't know what to think because... People step across those lines where nobody, nobody seems to know where they are. And the next moment, the mob is baying for their blood. It's strange, isn't it? In political correctness, you have this overwhelming tolerance. And then at the moment when someone steps across a line, peop, the mob is baying for their blood, baying for them to lose their jobs, baying for them to be destroyed. And that is what happens with a man-made system. The rules are here one day, they're there the next day. Some things that God said are wrong and an abomination are perfectly good and celebrated in political correctness. But then some things are very wrong. And then some things that were right yesterday are wrong today. The problem is not that political correctness is incorrect. Often it is correct. But the issue is not the political message itself. It's the problem that people make it up. It's not a true right and wrong. It it is something that is made up. It's kind of like a game we used to play when I was a kid called Mother May I. And it's so bizarre today. And yet many of us, and I fear that I'm guilty too, we buy in. Why do we buy into this? thought long and hard and prayed about this. I think it's because the system of political correctness hinges upon a kind of artificial sympathy. In other words, a person makes a bad choice, and we're sympathetic with this person for making a bad choice. And so consequently, well, we're sympathetic. And up to that moment, there's everything fine and nothing wrong, because we should be sympathetic with anyone who's struggling with anything. I mean, we should be sympathetic with each other. All of us are struggling with something. And Scripture tells us that God is sympathetic. And Jesus, in Hebrews 4, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. So when, when, when we see people making bad choices, sympathy is a good thing. It is a Christian thing. It is a Jesus thing. But our culture goes to a very dark and demonic place. It, it kind of communicates because we are sympathetic, then God must be a bully. And truth must be the enemy. And the culture uses good words, words that we love to bully us into submission. Good words. Take the word inclusive for a moment. That's a beautiful word. And I would hope that we're all inclusive. But the culture uses it like a a bullying stick to get you to comply. And no one ever seems to think critically about, you know, because at the moment anyone talks about, well, there are certain things that are wrong. Oh, you're not being inclusive. That's a beautiful word, but it's silly to use it without context. Because, let me just ask about being inclusive. When you go home at night, do you open your doors and put a sign up saying anyone who wants to live in our house can come live here? Of course not. Are you okay with your daughter dating an abuser? Well, then you're not being inclusive. See, see, here's the thing. Inclusive is a beautiful term, but it has to be used in a proper context, a context that makes rational sense. And then there's the word tolerant. And tolerance is, is one of the most beautiful words in the human language. And I'd hope we are all tolerant. But the question that I have for you today is, are you tolerant of every behavior? No. We all draw the line someplace. 
But the culture, use, again, uses those terms to bully anyone who disagrees with it. And what I do notice about our culture is that it's inclusive unless someone doesn't believe what it believes and suddenly they're not inclusive anymore. They're tolerant until someone disagrees with them and they're not tolerant anymore. All of that is an artificial kind of sympathy. It is not real, genuine sympathy. Let me prove it to you. You know the culture that you now live in. Suppose for a moment Sedgwick County decided that they were going to forgive all tickets for the month of March. Not going to report them to your insurance company. You don't have to pay for the ticket. And that's announced in the media. And for some of you who may have an outstanding ticket, that would be good news, right? No, you don't, don't nod your head. I just feel, feel where you are today. You know, that would be a big story, wouldn't it? I mean, that would be in all the media, as we would understand. And it wouldn't be long before there would be stories written about this, stories about single mothers who won't lose their driver's license. There would be stories about people who will have more grocery money now. And it wouldn't be long after reading enough of these stories that people would begin to talk about just how unfair the process of writing tickets is. And there would be people who would say, hey, I've got a story when I got a ticket and I didn't deserve it. And then the, it wouldn't be long before the voices would rise. We need to get rid of traffic cops. We need to get rid of tickets altogether in order to be sympathetic to these people who are not suffering because... They didn't have to pay for their ticket this month. Let's get rid of tickets. Let's get rid of traffic cops because we're sympathetic. So, in that world, how would you feel about your six-year-old walking across a crosswalk to get into school? How would you feel about turning your teenage kid loose to drive in that world? How would you feel when a member of your family is killed because someone is driving wrongly in a world where suddenly it isn't wrong anymore. See what I'm saying? There would be sympathy for the people that we read about, but there wouldn't be any sympathy for everyone who now has to function in that world. It's not a real sympathy. It's a, it's a boutique, artificial, kind of infantile sympathy. True sympathy requires critical thinking. It requires taking the long look. It, it requires understanding that there are reasons why things are right and things are wrong. Well, guys, all of this isn't happening in our world by accident. We're in the last days. And I want to just read this scripture to you because scripture is talking here about the coming of Antichrist, which really puts it right into our time frame. The Bible says this lawlessness, in other words, this idea that anything is okay, is already at work secretly, and it remains secret until the one holding it back steps out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. Then the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him. Verse 9, this man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power, signs, and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction. Why, why, would, he, why would he be able to fool them? Because they refuse to love and accept the truth. That would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies and they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. My time is up today, but I preach this message not knowing where we are, not knowing if we're minutes from the coming of Christ or decades. But I didn't decide to bring this message. I brought it because God, <laughs> like a boulder, sat on my chest until I... Surrender to preach this. When I think about where we are today in America and I read the Bible, it seems to me that we're most closely aligned with ancient Israel. When you read the book of the prophets, you will discover that God's people who were trained to know God and worship Jehovah, they were vacillating between worshiping God and Baal. Baal was the God of the Canaanites. Now, don't get wrapped up in the idea that people did things like bowing down before gold because they believed in the gold statue. There were lifestyles that went with those idols. And, and frankly, the cult of Baal was pretty much you can have sex with anyone you want to have sex with. It's, that's pretty much 21st century America. And no one's, no one's to say what's right and what's wrong. So I guess you can put two and two together and understand how a weakened group of God followers would say, oh, that is attractive. And so they would sort of go back and forth and they would worship God and they would you know, get together and sing and pray and listen to a message and worship God. And then they would go out and sleep with people who were not their wives and husbands. It was the worship of Baal. Now, God's prophet Elijah stood before his people on Mount Carmel one day, and he challenged them. And I think it's significant that Elijah didn't stand before the Canaanites because they worshiped Baal. He stood before the people of God and said, you have to decide today. 
You have to decide in your heart. You, have to, you don't have to follow God, but you do have to decide. And if you follow God, then you follow God. And if you don't follow God, don't claim to follow God. You do have to decide. You don't have to follow God. You don't have to believe God's word. Like I said, it's grace, not control. But you do have to decide. I see so much Christianity today. They're not sure that God, what God says is wrong is wrong. They're not sure what God says is right is right. They claim to be followers of God, and yet the messaging that frames their world comes from late night entertainment, social media, and peers. We need to pick. And I'll tell you why. Because ideas, in, even though ideas are vacillating, outcomes are not vacillating. Do, can I say that one more time? Ideas about right and wrong are all over the page. Outcomes are not. And I have made my choice. You know, if you, have, if you take a position in the market, you have to put your money on the table. You can have all kinds of ideas about which stocks are going up or down, but the moment you put your money on the table, you have a position. Well, this is a lot more important than money. I've put my soul on a position. I've put my soul on Jesus Christ. i put my soul in the Word of God. No, no one has to, but that's where mine is. Because here's the truth. All the voices of this world won't be there to receive my soul three seconds after I die. And the silly arbiters of political correctness won't be who I stand before to give an account. And the mob on the comment threads will not decide my destiny. 2,000 years ago, God sent his son into the world to hang on a cross and receive us even though we were sinners and flawed and failed. And as I said, he has sympathy for our weaknesses. But for those who come to Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior, then we have made our choice to follow him and believe in him. It's the most important thing I'm going to say today probably. Every week we talk about the love and the grace and the forgiveness of God. In order to really understand that message, you must understand that sin is sin and I'm a sinner and I want to be saved from it. Somehow in the 21st century, American Christians have gotten the idea that sin is okay because God is a God of grace. Have we ever thought critically about that? If I say sin is okay, I am saying, <laughs> I'm saying the thing that drove the nails into Jesus' hands are okay. I'm saying the thing that drove the nail in Jesus' feet is fine. I'm saying there's nothing wrong with what drove the crowns into his brow. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not the same as grace. Grace is the understanding that sin is sin. And my sin put Jesus on the cross. And even though I am wrong, I will agree that God is right. And even if I'm struggling with sin and temptation, and even if I fall today... I am the one who is wrong, and God is the one who is right. I need a savior, not a cosmic sugar daddy in the sky to agree with whatever I want him to believe. And so I stand before you today, the Holy Spirit having led me to discharge my responsibility. And I love you. I love you. I believe like I love my life. I love you enough to say, you don't have to accept Jesus, but you do have to decide. You do have to decide. Like Joshua who stood before his people and he said, if it doesn't seem right to you to serve God, then pick your God. But he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I believe that God is looking for young men, young women, kids, young adults of all ages to say, in these dark days, I don't care if everybody in the elevator faces the rear. My eyes are on the future. My eyes are toward the front. In these dark days, I will not face the rear. God bless you. Thank you for being here.